Lord Jesus, you are a marvel and a wonder. We love you. And you have brought life to a broken world and you included us in that. And so we pray, Lord God, Holy Spirit, that you will this morning sink, saturate, and bring percolate deep into our minds, our emotions, and our wills this great truth of what you have done, Lord God. Rejuvenate us, rehydrate us, and take us forward in your great love. And it's in Christ's name we ask these things. Amen. 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 Please be seated. And just because it's really fun, go ahead and get your, you ready? Ready? Hallelujah! Christ is risen! The Lord is risen indeed! Hallelujah! Praise the Lord. Uh, as we, uh, first of all, uh, yeah, Easter Sunday. Ah, oh, it's here. I don't know about you, but I'm so ready. For it. I know that there are many things going on. I know that we're not done with the COVID yet. I know, I know, I know. But today is Easter, and I'm loving it. Amen, Amen. Amen. right? Hallelujah. <laughs> we're going to be uh, spending our time in Acts uh, chapter 10, but before we get there, uh, we, it seems like we might want to do a couple of things. Sort of, we're going to seat ourselves um, as best we can, but with the power of the Holy Spirit. Seat ourselves. In, in just some initial thoughts of, of, of Easter, what is Easter, what is resurrection? So if you want to, for our minds, if you will, for our intellects, um, Easter, it, the, you could do a lot worse than the Isaiah reading to get a picture of resurrection. The idea that death is, death is removed from the landscape. The veil is taken away from the mountain. The work is done, the restoration. This has always been God's desire always been his vision, always been his heart, that this new creation would, be, would become into reality, and that this is resurrection. So if you need a picture of resurrection, I would suggest this as the grand picture of resurrection. Trade up from this one. You live, you stop breathing. Someday, you, stop, you start breathing again, and you just never stop breathing. That's okay. That's okay but to view the resurrection as all of humanity and life who would enter in with God to be, be brought into God's sure and beautiful and strong vision, the richest and best vision you can imagine, God still wants more and still has more in mind and still carries us forward into this and gives us the privilege, gives us the privilege of entering into it by giving him glory and by loving our brothers and sisters. So if with our minds we have something like this in, in mind when we hear the word resurrection, then we're in a good place. Um, our bishop, Ken Ross, uh, I had a, a prayer ready to sort of work into our hearts and emotions and wills as well as our minds. But this morning, Bishop Ken sent a prayer that we're going to use instead. Um, it's not easy to bump John of Damascus off the playlist. <laughs> it's not easy. Um, but Ken Ross has managed to do it this morning. And so we want, I'm going to pray uh, this prayer, and I want to sort of listen. There are, many, there are many parts to it, but ask the Holy Spirit to sort of to give you and sink deep into you the pieces and the peace that you very much need. I'll just also add that I think it's great that we have a local bishop offering this words, these words to his pastors and to his congregations. It's so easy for, for the, the, the truly grand, cosmos-changing concepts of the resurrection to sort of live up there, when in actual fact it is meant to change lives here. It is meant to be implemented here. It is meant to restore creation here. And so to have a local bishop sending us his words, I think just sort of grounds these marvelous ideas, these marvelous, this marvelous truth in the reality of where we are at today. This is what uh, the bishop sent. Alleluia. Christ is risen. Life for the lifeless. Well done. Hope for the hopeless. Honor for the shamed. Beauty for the corrupted. Faith for the faithless. Comfort for the afflicted. 
family for the lonely, rest for the weary, glory for the diminished, joy for the joyless, generosity for the grasping. May you know these truths more fully on this day. May you be soaked in and shaped by the goodness, life, and grace of our resurrected Lord, so that you may walk with the humility and honor of being sons and daughters of the King of Kings, with nothing to prove, nothing lacking, nothing to fear, with assurance and generosity, shaping our desires, thoughts, words, and actions. I am thankful for you. You are seen. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Now with this, these truths, is something of it, again by the Holy Spirit, percolated into our minds and down into our hearts. Turn to Acts chapter 10 if you have your Bibles with you. Peter has, um, the, we, we, uh, Jesus has ascended to heaven. Uh, the Holy Spirit has been sent and given to, to all believers. This is a new move. This is a new thing that's been done in the cosmos. And it was accomplished by the death of Christ to relieve, relieve, release God's very spirit over as all people. This is a sure sign of what Jeremiah called the new covenant. It is the sure sign of what Paul calls the new covenant, that we are new covenant ministers. And Peter and all of the apostles have, have um, received this, this great infilling of the Holy Spirit. As believers, we also have the Holy Spirit living in us. As believers, every believer has the Spirit of God himself living inside of us. We are members of the family, and we're given the family resemblance by the Father's very spirit living inside of us to form that resemblance in us. Peter has, been, has gone uh, down to the coast, and he is healed, and he is preached, and he's in a place called Joppa, and uh, he has a vision uh, from God where all the things that before... Now, he's a good Jewish boy, and he, um, and he grew up, and he, he was true to the culture as far as we know, as far as any Jew was. And he was true to the culture, he was true to his upbringing. And something happened, though. God showed him a vision that said, in actual fact, I have superseded even what I gave you before. And now all that stuff you thought you couldn't eat because it made you unclean, it made you unable to be in my presence for worship, I now say, even if you do that, you are still able to be in my presence and worship me by virtue of the fact that the Holy Spirit has been given to you and you've believed on Jesus Christ. And the stuff that's been between us has been washed away. Has been, has been washed away. And Peter is, um, Peter is sort of stunned by this, needless to say. Um, this covenant of the old covenant is being uh, superseded and enveloped and, in, and made even more true to itself by this new covenant. And so he doesn't even get to sort of revel in this, it doesn't appear, before somebody knocks on the door. Because what has happened is, in another, up in Caesarea, a centurion, a Roman centurion. Now, two things here. He's, he is a Christ, he's a God-fearer. That means that he actually um, offers prayers to God, to Yahweh, to the Jewish God. He gives money to, um, to, the, to the temple and to the synagogue. And, but he hasn't converted to Judaism. But he is, uh, by all accounts, a righteous man before God. Now, that this is tough to believe because he is a Roman centurion. Now, that if you think, if you have fears about our society and our culture today, to live in first century Rome was to breathe the air of the biggest and worst greed, sexual exploitation, exploitation of women and other races and slavery that you can imagine. I don't even want to describe it to you in public. But that is the air you breathe as a subject of Rome. It is 20 times what we imagine today. And I'm not saying that to say that today we don't have struggles. I'm not saying that at all. Please don't go there. But I'm telling you that a Roman who had every right to do anything he wanted with anybody he wanted except another Roman at any time he wanted is now calling Peter 
to go see him. And this Roman doesn't even know why. He's like the other centurion, the obedient one. Um, he's, God just spoke to him. God said, go get Simon. Go get Simon Peter. And um, he, if it's me, I'm saying, well, okay, but, you know, what's the plan? Um, and I expect God to, you know, tell me what the plan is. And, um, and yeah, he says, and God just says, go get Simon Peter. So the centurion is open and obedient. Open and obedient. So he sends two of his servants and one of his guards to Joppa to get Peter. I'd be thinking, Lord, do you know how many man hours this is? I'm wasting people and time and resources. And you're not even going to tell me why? He's obedient. So these two men, these three men, knock on Peter's door. And they say, the centurion wants to see you. Peter again. Now then, it probably helps having a life-changing vision, right, to keep you open to God. But Peter himself also says, well, why am I going? He doesn't say, why am I going? He doesn't say, what's the plan? I'm a busy guy, doing miracles, healing people, preaching the word. Just had a great vision. I'd love to sort of sit with it for a while. Right? Instead, he goes. And when he gets there, the centurion, again, totally obedient, just says, glad you're here. What do you have for us? Glad you're here. What do you have for us? And Peter is stunned by his faithfulness. And it would appear that during this encounter then, the Holy Spirit falls on the centurion and his household. And they begin to exhibit the gifts of having that spirit of Yahweh, the spirit of God, descend upon him. And Peter, who it would be easy to sort of get stuck in his boxes, right? It'd be easier for him to say, whoa, 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 this isn't really happening. Because we all know that the Gentiles don't get the spirit, at least until you become Jews. It'd be easy for him to sort of doubt it or put it in a different box, but God has exploded his boxes. And the only thing that he can say is, oh my gosh, this is the sure sign of the living God. And he has fallen on these people, and we're going to baptize them. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we're going to bring them into the body of Christ. We're going to acknowledge them as, as the one God, blinding to the one God. And he baptizes them. Then he says this. Now then, it's been a big day for Peter. There's a lot going on here. But then he says this. So Peter opened his mouth and said, Truly I understand that God shows no partiality. Now then, if he understands something, that means that there must have been a misunderstanding that indeed he understood God to have partiality. And, and we know that this extended along ethnic lines, racial lines, cultural lines. But it would appear that Peter now knows that God shows no partiality. And this actually shows up throughout the Old Testament, that indeed God has knocked down these walls, as Paul writes in Ephesians, that in every nation, every nation, Anyone who fears him and does his, what does what is right is embraced by him. It says acceptable to him, but I'm going to give a loose translation. Is embraced by him. Now, you, have a, you, would, you couldn't do better for a definition of faith than that. That fears him, that is, believes him, knows him, and does what is right. That gives her life over to him to live in his name and then lives it out by doing what is right. You'd be hard-pressed to find a better definition of faith. No partiality. This sermon of this time of Peter, I think, raises, potentially can raise some legitimate questions for us. One might be this. Are we committed? Are we committed to any and everyone being in the resurrection? Are we committed to any and every one being in the resurrection. Not always sort of tolerant of it. Like, frankly, I can't stand them, but God, if you're going to have them, fine. No. 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 Not ignoring it. Well, that's God's business. I'm sure he'll handle it just fine. Are we committed to having every and any one in the resurrection. Because God shows no partiality. 
Now then, if your, uh, your little bells are going off about how we have to do this, do that, all that, blah, 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 that's fine. Because there are responsibilities in covenant. There are responsibilities in covenant with God. But let's start here. Are we committed to any and every one being in the resurrection? Amen? Amen. He goes on then to say that as for the word that he sent to Israel, preaching good news of peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. That would say Jesus, who is this anointed one of God, who is the king of everybody. And we're so used to these, these titles of, of, of our Lord's roll off our tongue. But the man Jesus, right, the backwoods far, um, carpenter, the man Jesus, who has been anointed by God to be his special representative and is the king of everybody. Preaching the good news through him. You yourselves know what happened throughout all Judea. Let's stop right there. Preaching the good news of peace. Why is peace such a big deal? Because ever since Genesis 3, we know that we have not had peace with God. We have been enveloped, caught up in this dominion and power of sin and death. We can't help it. As one English author says, we have the natural inclination to mess things up. Now, he's not a real, he's, he's, a, he's, an, he's an Englishman, right? He, he admits, he finds it hard to be a Christian. He's a little embarrassed, right, in, in, in public company to admit that he's a Christian. But the thing is that he can't help but acknowledge that himself and everybody he knows is the inherent reflex to mess things up. And that when he goes into a church, he senses the inherent reflex of God to have mercy on those who seek him. He's not a great theologian. He admits it. He's, a great, he's actually a very good writer and well-known in the secular world, in secular places, a writer. But as far as his Christianity, as he thinks it through and struggles, he knows he and everybody else has a natural reflex to mess it up and cause harm. No exception. And yet, when he comes into God's presence, it is God's reflex to have mercy on him when he comes. We have peace with God. We have peace with God. Christ on the cross broke those powers of sin, brought us into his family, has equipped us by his spirit to day by day more and more grow into the healing and the deep goodness and the new creation vision of God himself. It's an amazing thing. It's an amazing thing. And then, by he also then, uh, this idea, we also then know this peace, and we are called then, like Peter and the others, to share this peace. Uh, article in Inc. Magazine. Uh, I was sort of stunned. A guy um, tries his, his tip for a better employee relations or relationships with anybody at the workplace, right? Inc. Magazine, workplace, is when he, whenever he encounters somebody, especially if they're having a hard time with one another, he says to himself, I love you. Inc. Magazine? I thought maybe it was Christianity Today and I hit the wrong link. This is what he says, I love you. We as people who share in this peace, and like Peter and the rest, preach this good peace in our living. We offer this peace to those around us. This is how the world is healed. This is how God does his work. It is when millions and billions of believers know God's peace themselves personally and are determined to bring that to bear everywhere they go. They are determined in every relationship and in every encounter to bring the effects of God's peace to bear. And then God, the Holy Spirit, and those people will work it out how well they live in that peace. But it is our job 
to let it be known that the stuff that's killing us is no longer what owns us. That Jesus is offering peace with God. Oh, I'll take that all day and twice on Sunday. He then goes on. He tells the story of Jesus. This is the key. Israel was constantly telling the story of the Exodus and their release from Egypt. It was their foundational story. We now have a foundational story, and it is the life and teaching of Jesus. This happened at Pentecost when Peter was preaching. This happened when Stephen went to his death. When Stephen went to his death, what did he offer? The story of Jesus. We tell the story of Jesus. Because, brothers and sisters, there's a new set of facts on the ground. The, new, the statistic, the perfect statistic, is now broken. The perfect statistic was, with a few Old Testament exceptions, um, one out of one dies. It's the perfect statistic. One out of one dies. Except Jesus. Now the perfect statistic no longer holds. The perfect statistic is no longer universally true. The perfect statistic is not what we have to accept as our lot in life. Now we have a different statistic. That indeed, that indeed, because of Jesus, the facts on the ground are different. Let's get this through our heads. The facts on the ground are not what they were. This is not some concept. This is not some pie in the sky. This is not some philosophy. This is a man who was murdered and tortured to death and now has been raised from the dead. And we know now, because of his teaching, that this was actually just the first fruits of that whole process. That was the first fruits of, of Isaiah. That was the first fruits of Revelation. That was just the beginning that anyone who will throw their lot in with him will go with him. Peter says, we have been chosen by God as witnesses. Right? He doesn't say, we all went out in the desert, found these great mushrooms, and came up with this cool idea. Right? No, he says, we are witnesses. We know what we saw. And it is glorious. And it is strong. And it is beautiful. We ate and drank with him. And he rose from the dead. So a question for us might be, whatever stories we tell, do they flow from Jesus' story? Whatever stories we tell, do they flow from Jesus' story? I'm not ashamed to say that any other story is at best, second best. Do all our stories flow from Jesus' story? Do my conversations flow from Jesus' story? Now then, I know it's hard, and we're all broken and busted up people, and sometimes our stories flow out of our brokenness. I know. I know. I get it. But Jesus says, look, child, I am, I am living in you and your brokenness. And your story doesn't just have to come from your brokenness. It can come from Jesus himself healing the broken, even if it takes all our lives. Do our emails flow from the story of Jesus? Ouch. Do our texts flow from the story of Jesus? Do our Facebook posts flow from the story of Jesus? Now, that's not to say you have to shoehorn the word Jesus into every conversation. Right? Being, a, being a, a sort of newly on fire believer when I was 16, um, I, was, I hope that God may have used it in some way, but I'm also quite sure in retrospect that it was completely obnoxious. But um, I, would, I came out for sure, I truly, Bible in my back pocket all the time. <laughs> all the time. And this is high school, right? So I come to somebody, Ross, how are you, man? Isn't it a great day? You say, yes, it's a great day. I say, yes, it is. You know who made the day? God the Father. And you know he had a son? And that that son died for your sins? <laughs> that went over really well with my fellow athletes, high school athletes in Texas. 
So it's a, I know athletics is, is I don't know, Texas athletics is something unique. It just is. And, um, and so uh, when I pulled that with my, uh, with my fellow athletes in the locker room, it got um, varied responses. <laughs> Although this process got a little better when somebody finally went, designated driver. <laughs> we, we, take, we take the traction we can get with the gospel, right? So whatever stories we tell, do they flow from Jesus' story. Peter goes on. And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one appointed by God to judge the living and the dead. To him all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him and receives forgiveness of sins through his name. Everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. If you're worried about evil, he is the judge of the living and the dead. He will take care of the evil. This is one of the great things about judgment. We actually want judgment. Does anybody here want evil to go on forever? No, of course not. We want judgment. We want evil dealt with. We want good utterly established. And it is Jesus who will establish that. And everyone who believes in him and receives forgiveness of sins through his name. Just sit with that for a minute. That we believe in him and that we receive. That we believe in him and that we receive. that we believe in him and that we receive from this place of being, of being saved, from this place of being bought out of darkness and death and again all the things that are killing us and all the things that have been killing us in this broken world. From this place we can move forward first and foremost and frequently with God's mercy and embrace to take into a broken world. It's been a long haul. And we're not done yet, I understand. But could it be that this Easter, thank God Easter's a whole season, right? But could it be that this Easter no matter what the world says, but that in our hearts, even if we're tired, we believe and we receive and we begin to turn a corner. We begin in his mercy and grace to turn a corner in our own hearts because he has received us and healed us in the world that is desperate, desperate, desperate to know his love and his peace, that we become even more than we are the people who are turning the corner, bringing more light into the darkness, being more salt in a world that's flat and gray and dark because of the resurrection. The resurrection is real and happening. And we can be caught up in it today. I'm going to end with uh, Bishop Ken's prayer again. And then we'll continue in our worship. Did you know that the reading of the scriptures and the expising of it is also worship? The proclamation of the scriptures and reading is also worship. Alleluia, Christ is risen. Life for the lifeless. Hope for the hopeless. Honor for the shamed. Beauty for the corrupted. Faith for the faithless. Comfort for the afflicted. Family for the lonely. Rest 
for the weary. Glory for the diminished. Joy for the joyless. Generosity for the grasping. May you know these truths more fully on this day. May you be soaked in and shaped by the goodness, life, and grace of our resurrected Lord, so that you may walk with the humility and honor of being sons and daughters of the King of Kings, with nothing to prove, nothing lacking, nothing to fear, with assurance and generosity shaping our desires, thoughts, words, and actions. I am thankful for you. You are seen. There are a new set of facts on the ground. He is risen, and we have work to do. Father, we love you. We pray, Lord God, Holy Spirit, that as we, as we continue, that you will take the words today and sink them deep into our hearts and minds, that you will reform our thinking, just as you did with Peter, renew our emotion and our feeling, redirect our actions and our will, all so that we may believe and receive your staggering love, and that we may be a means of peace in a world that's desperate for it. We ask these things not because we are so clever or energetic or anything in our own might, but only in your mighty name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen.